Hi, and welcome to Bright Minds from Tickmill. I'm your host, Patrick Munley, and in this series, we're setting out to answer some of the most commonly asked questions around investment and trading through entertaining and insightful conversations with seasoned insiders. Throughout history, financial crises have tested the resilience of economies, industries, and traders, from the Great Depression to the more recent global financial crisis. These pivotal moments have reshaped the way we view and navigate financial markets. While the chaos of these events can strike fear into the hearts of investors, By adapting your investment strategy, it's possible to weather the storm and there are even potential opportunities for smart traders to profit during turbulent times. The COVID-19 pandemic provided a remarkable example of how markets can be profoundly affected by crisis. In the first quarter of 2020, global stock markets experienced one of the most dramatic sell-offs in history, which saw the Dow Jones Industrial Average losing 12.9% of its value in a single day and UK GDP declining by 9.7%. Despite this turmoil, traders who were willing to take calculated risks and enter the market at the right moment managed to capitalise on the volatility, leading to substantial gains. Trading in crises demands a unique set of skills and an understanding of how market dynamics can shift rapidly. It requires not only a keen eye for spotting opportunities amidst chaos, but also the ability to manage risk effectively. Stakes are high, as the wrong decision can lead to significant losses. So what causes recessions and market volatility? How are current events affecting the market? And what can we do as investors to protect our capital and ride out a downturn? To give us some insight into these topics, we're joined by Joe Groves. Joe is a qualified chartered accountant and had a career as an investment banker for 20 years before moving into the world of journalism. She currently writes on all aspects of investing for Forbes and the Evening Standard. Joe, thanks for joining us today. Could you start off by telling us a bit more about your career so far? Sure. First off, thank you very much for having me on the show today. Um, I started off training as a chartered accountant at Arthur Anderson, who were then one of the large accountancy firms. I worked in the audit department. I think it gave me a really good grounding in finance, but I decided eventually it was time to seek a job where my client didn't avoid me like the plague. So I joined Close Brothers, who are a UK investment bank working in the corporate finance department, mainly on acquisitions and disposals for corporate and private equity clients. Very long hours and a steep learning curve, but really interesting to have that insight into corporate transactions. I then dropped to working part time when I had children and having that free time really sparked my interest in investing. I have an interest only mortgage and a pension backed by investments. And while I had a financial advisor, I felt I really should be able to take control of my own investments. So I took the plunge. And over the last 15 years, I've really enjoyed developing my investment knowledge. I've definitely learned as much from my mistakes as my successes. Uh, I also really enjoy chatting to friends and family about investing. I promise only when they ask me to. And one of my passions is to break down barriers to make investing accessible to everybody. So as you mentioned, um, I decided to join the investment team at Forbes, where I write about investing for Forbes Advisor UK and the Evening Standard. Wow. Could you briefly define um, the terms recession and volatility, I guess, through your 15 year track record now, personally managing your your finances and investments, you've experienced both. And could you give us a quick overview of of what causes both of those elements? Sure. I think that's a really interesting question because both have been very much on the menu for investors over the last couple of years. So starting off with recessions, I guess it's worth differentiating between what's a more challenging macroeconomic environment, which we've definitely seen, and what technically is a recession, which is two consecutive quarters of negative growth in GDP. Fears of recession very much were prevalent in the financial press last year. We had the perfect storm of high inflation, high interest rates, high government borrowing. And I think recession was widely anticipated in the second half of last year. We saw GDP fall slightly in quarter three, but actually it then defied expectations by being flat in quarter four. So we kind of avoided the recession. Um, And actually looking over the year as a whole, the UK was the fastest growing economy in the G7 group. So double that of France and the US. But turning into 2023, much more widespread pessimism, the UK was going to enter a recession at some point. I think it's looking marginally more positive, but it's still very finely balanced. I think one of the factors is that consumer spending accounts for two thirds of GDP in the UK. So when we have a squeeze in the cost of living, as we're having at the moment, that significantly raises the risk of recession in the UK. You mentioned causes. I think that's useful to look at because it's useful for how we set up our portfolio for investing through recessions. 
So as we know, we entered a recession after the global financial crisis in 2008. GDP fell by 6%, took around five years for that to recover. In terms of causes, I mean, these are very well documented, but we saw the collapse of Lehman Brothers. That sent shockwaves through the global financial system. And the global credit crunch triggered a downwards economic spiral. So we had a fall in house prices. We saw households in negative equity. That led to a fall in consumer spending and confidence, and kind of so it went downwards. We then saw a recession again in 2020 as global economies uh, reeled from the impact of the pandemic lockdowns. We had a fall in consumer demand. We had severe disruption of global supply chains. And as you mentioned earlier, GDP in the UK fell by 10%, which was the worst in 300 years. But actually, three years on, GDP is almost recovered in the UK and it's higher in the eurozone in the US. So it fell more sharply, but it recovered more quickly than in the global financial crisis. So if we take a kind of overview, I guess recessions are a normal part of the economic cycle. They generally happen every eight to 12 years and they typically recover in around three to five years. So as investors, we've got to be prepared to position to invest through recessions as well as kind of times of economic boom. In terms of volatility, that's a measure of the function of the fluctuation of the price of an asset. So the percentage it changes and over what time period. So if it fluctuates considerably over a short time, it's said to be highly volatile. And there's a volatility index. It measures the expected volatility in the S&P 500 over the following 30 days. And that's inversely related to the S&P 500. So if we see the S&P 500 falling, we see the fix rising, we see the increase in volatility, and we see investors starting to fear a stock market crash, which can become self-fulfilling if it triggers panic selling. Unsurprisingly, we saw the VIX spike in 2008 at the global financial crisis and also in 2020 at the start of the pandemic. But actually, even after that, it remains slightly elevated in 2021 and 2022. We had fears of a possible recession. We had the invasion of Ukraine and we had fears of a wider banking crisis. We saw the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank in the US and the rescue of Credit Suisse in Europe. Looking now, I think relative calm has been restored. The volatility index has fallen back to near average levels, but it's obviously still something that could be spiking up in the future. I think probably worth mentioning at this point, um, we all know Warren Buffett, legendary investor, but one of his supposed quotes is, uh, rule number one, never lose money. Rule number two, never forget rule number one. And I think it's certainly true to say that the easiest way to make money in the long term is not to lose it over the short term. So if your asset's falling by 50%, it needs to rise by 100% to get you back to break even. So I think some investors are comfortable with volatility from equities. Some aren't particularly there, for example, about to draw a pension. So I think overall volatility, definitely worth considering if you're looking at ways of positioning your portfolio more defensively. The get rich quick scheme is, is what draws a lot of people into it. And like you say there, one of the, the key elements really is preservation of capital before profit on capital. And people often overlook that. How do you think uh, current events are affecting the market? And, and especially in terms of the VIX, we've seen such a dampening in the VIX with, I guess, also the attraction of um, these zero date options. Uh, a lot of money is flowing into those. And prior to that, people would have been protecting the downside by maybe allocating capital to the VIX, whereas now they're just chasing upside with these zero to, to date option expirations. As you say, there's still a high level of uncertainty in the market, and that is creating potential risk and volatility for investors. I think you asked about current events. I would say geopolitical risk still very much takes centre stage not only the conflict in Ukraine, but also relations between the US and China. And we have a high level of economic uncertainty that, as we've discussed, that that downturn may develop into a full-blown recession. And I think the main issue here, issue here is inflation. It's fallen in the US from 9% to 4%. But the UK inflation remains stubbornly high. We saw it hit a 40-year high of 11% in October, and it's still the highest in the G7 at just under 9%. In the UK, inflation is not forecast to fall back to the 2% target until late next year. So I think it's going to continue to be an issue. And as a result, we've seen central banks hiking base rates. We've seen 10 in the US. We've seen 12 in the UK. I think it looks like it may have peaked at least for now in the US, but the UK rate looks likely to increase further, potentially 5.56%. You know, so in terms of how those current events have played out on stock markets over the last 18 months, I think the US and the UK have been on very different trajectories. Uh, 2022 saw a bloodbath for the tech-heavy Nasdaq index. It fell by a third. You know, Meta and Tesla hit even harder. They saw drops around two thirds. And we saw interest rates taking their toll on tech stock valuations. And with fears of recession, I think investor uh, sentiment switched very much from growth stocks to more defensive options. 
And the FTSE 100, which is full of blue chip plodders in more defensive sectors, reaped the rewards. It delivered a 1% gain in 2022, not huge, but notable given steep falls elsewhere. And it broke through the magic 8,000 barrier in February this year. Some of the key performers there were commodity firms. They benefited from the rising prices. So we saw the likes of BP and Shell reporting bumper profits. Also, uh, investors attracted by the high dividend yields on offer. But over the last few months, we've seen a complete reversal in fortunes helped by the more positive economic signals in the US relative to the UK. We see the FTSE 100 down by about 5% in the last couple of months, NASDAQ up by about 10% and a third year to date. So I think investors seem to be more bullish. They're tempted back into growth stocks, trading at a discount. We've seen Tesla doubling. We've seen Nvidia's share price almost tripling this year. So I think you know people are being tempted back into those stocks that perhaps are trading at lower levels than they have been historically. And I think that the fears of recession for the UK are very much weighing on valuations. The full impact of interest rate increases, I think, are yet to be felt fully by borrowers. We've got around 1 million fixed rate mortgages coming to an end this year. Many of those are at sub 2%. So I think those rising borrowing costs are going to start to bite, unfortunately, add in high inflation, and we'll probably see quite a steep drop in real disposable income. And that, as we've talked about, that starts leading to a fall in consumer spending. That puts downwards pressure on corporate earnings and stock markets. So I think current events in the UK are looking rather more pessimistic at the moment. But that said, Stock markets are obviously forward looking, so the bad news is priced in to some extent. But I think if inflation remains sticky and there's more base rate increases, that's likely to put further downwards pressure on stock markets. So I guess that would be uh, it would be pertinent then to think about how um, how people manage their investments during potential turbulent times, and what are some of the strategies such as defensive investing and diversification that investors can employ? Yeah, definitely. I think defensive investing is. Is something that most investors are looking at at the moment. But I think probably before kind of getting into the detail of that, you know, I think, as I'm sure you'd agree, there isn't a cookie cutter approach to defensive investing. I'm sure those of us that work in investing were often asked for advice by friends and family. They think we'll pull it out of our back pocket in five minutes and off they go. But it has to be tailored to your appetite for risk and your investment horizon, um, whether it's defensive or otherwise. You know, we all know that risk is in the eye of the beholder. So are we prepared to accept losses because we want higher gains or are we more cautious and we want to limit our downside? Actually, Phoebe um, made some very interesting points in her podcast that women have tend to have a lower appetite for risk than male counterparts. So I think you've got to think about your level of risk. And if you can't stomach the ride, you probably shouldn't be pursuing a more high risk strategy in terms of your portfolio. And then investment horizon, you know, are you investing for a pension in 20 years time? Are you potentially investing for a couple of years for a house deposit? You know, we know the stock market is naturally cyclical. It tends to fall around 20 to 50 percent every eight to 10 years. It took stock markets around four years to recover after the dot-com bubble and the global financial crisis. So rule of thumb is to invest for at least five years. And if that's not the case, you probably should be looking at more cash-based investments. So coming back to your question about uncertainty, I think diversifying your portfolio across different assets is a good idea. So equities and bonds and possibly alternative assets such as commodities, that's going to help smooth, hopefully, average returns and volatility. The proportion will vary by investors. We've spoken about often there's a 60-40 rule, 60 in equity, 40 in lower risk assets such as bonds. And typically, bonds and equities have been a good hedge. So during the global financial crisis, we saw equities falling. We saw bonds rising as investors kind of sought lower risk assets. But last year was the exception where we saw bonds and equities fall for the first time in 30 years. And actually, it was a degree of the, the fall that was fairly unprecedented. Global bonds fell by 30 percent last year, UK even worse. And it was the worst performance in bonds in more than a century. You know, we saw a hike in interest rates that pushed down bond prices. We saw unfunded tax cuts in the UK that were later reversed. But all of these kind of things weighed on the bond market last year and bonds ended up becoming rather a liability rather than a safe asset. But if you put last year aside, bonds have been a pretty good addition when there's uncertainty. If we look over the 40 years to 2021, bonds delivered a real annual return of around 6% versus 7% for equity. So a pretty good return um, in relative terms. And then there's alternative assets you could consider. So commodities, potentially, or the top performing fund sector last year, average return of around 20%. Often grouped together as one asset class, but actually they can be very different. Often gold is seen as a safe haven in times of uncertainty. So we saw the price spike after the invasion of Ukraine and again after the collapse of SVB. It's currently trading near its all-time high. It can be a very good hedge, but it also can be quite a fickle friend at times. 
And then we've got industrial metals. So, for example, lithium and nickel, they're seen as key, man, uh, key materials in the transition to green energy. And there's a whole host of other commodities, oil, gas, agricultural products, all of which tend to be a bit more cyclical than precious metals. But if we step back and look at commodities, they can be quite volatile in terms of price. So probably something worth only having potentially 5 to 10 percent of your portfolio invested in and potentially going more towards a multi-commodity ETF rather than a single commodity. And then finally, there's absolute return funds. They aim to deliver positive returns, whatever the market. They can be a good way of making modest returns and avoiding losses. So I think in a nutshell, defensive investors probably want to look at diversifying, diversifying across equities and bonds. More risk, of, uh, more risk averse investors might choose a higher proportion of bonds and potentially adding in other assets such as commodities if you can stomach the volatility along the way. Yeah, I guess so. Thinking about conservative investors and those uh, with a, let's say, a more uh, healthy risk appetite. What are what are some of the um, the psychological factors such as that fear and greed um, in trading during crisis? How can they impact decision making? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question because, as you mentioned, those factors, fear, greed, others, can have a huge impact on decision making. And actually, collectively, they can trigger that downward spiral and become self fulfilling because the stock market starts to kind of spiral towards a crash. In terms of fear, I think probably number one fear for investors is losing money or potentially missing out on gains. Um, and that can lead to either panic selling or it can lead to inaction and indecision. In terms of greed, I think nearly all investors seek financial gains. So that somewhat goes without saying. But greed is more about excessive gains. Um, and if you're a Michael Douglas fan, you might have watched the film Wall, uh, Wall Street, where he plays the character of Gordon Gecko, who says greed is good. But unfortunately, greed isn't always good for investors because it can tempt us to seek high risk investments, kind of chasing those high returns. And then you end up potentially increasing the risk of losses because you're not really making good decisions based on your long term investment principles. And I think greed can also contribute to a herd mentality where individuals are following the crowd and they're not carrying out their own research. We've seen uh, a rise in the popularity of social trading. And I think that can be a really good resource for investors in terms of sharing ideas. But again, there's a risk that you get people pumping and dumping stocks and you're the one that's bought the overvalued stock and you suffer the loss afterwards. I think in terms of greed, I mean, I don't know about you, but I think we all succumbed to greed at one point. Um, I bought shares in investment platform Hargreaves Lansdowne on that IPO. They raised tenfold over the next 10 years. I should have sold them at that point, but I stayed invested because you hope that the gravy train's going to keep going. Unfortunately, it didn't. They're now at a third of that high. So I think we can all learn lessons in terms of greed, um, no matter how long we've been investing for. And you mentioned the VIX index for volatility. We've also got the fear and greed index. Um, so a low value suggests a high level of fear where investors may be overly pessimistic. Uh, and we saw that at the start of the global financial crisis and also the pandemic. And a high value is a high level of greed, so potentially overly optimistic and perhaps the market will start to correct itself. And we saw that in late 2020 when markets rallied as people started to hope for a COVID um, vaccine. I think... One of the main pitfalls of greed and arguably fear is buying shares on the dip. So shares that you think are a bargain and apologies in advance to cat owners. But I think the risk here is a so-called dead cat bounce. So when the dot com bubble burst, we saw nine major rallies in the Nasdaq, some as high as 45 percent. But after each rally, there was a new low and overall the Nasdaq fell by 80 percent in that period. So I think it's really difficult to time the bottom of the market. And I think another pitfall is probably panic selling. So fear gets the better of you. You sell your investments to sit out the downturn, but you'll then risk uh, missing out on the recovery. And if we look at peak to trough, the FTSE 100 fell by 50% in early 2009, but increased by over 60% in the following 12 months. And similarly, in the pandemic fell by 36%, rose by 22% in the following year. So I think as investors, it's hard, but we've got to take a deep breath and try to hang in there, really. I was um, guilty of this in the pandemic. I sold some of my portfolio. And, you know, if I hadn't, I'd have made a much higher return. So it can be quite frustrating. But I think, you know, it's time in the market that counts, not timing the market. So we've got to stay invested through the ups and downs if we can, because it's almost impossible to get the timing right each time. Yeah, I mean, and especially at the moment, there's a, it's quite hotly debated amongst the, the analyst community whether or not certainly the US markets are entering a new bull market or we're actually in one of the most aggressive bear market rallies to, that, that we've witnessed in, in recent times. And so what are some of the ways in which investors have previously managed to, to profit during a crisis? 
we saw nearly 2 million people becoming day traders in the UK during the pandemic, which is a pretty amazing statistic. And I think platforms have really opened up trading to retail investors. We've got trading derivatives. Um, we've got access to real-time data streams, advanced trading tools. So I think day trading is no longer limited to the large institutions as it was. And we know that traders exploit short-term price movements. So actually volatility during a crisis can mean higher profits if you're a trader. And if we look back over the last couple of years, commodity traders have seen a huge spike in profits from the geopolitical crisis in Ukraine. That led to soaring prices for commodities such as oil, gas and wheat. And that caused large fluctuations on commodity markets for traders. In terms of other ways of profiting as a trader, I suppose short selling in uh, falling markets is another option. You know, we looked at 2019, the most shorted stocks were Tesla, Amazon and Apple. If you looked at the same list now, it would be heavy in UK retailers, so Ocado, Kingfisher, Boohoo. But I think short selling can be a controversial practice, particularly when it's carried out by hedge funds who obviously make quite significant profits when share prices start to fall. I think we probably all know the story of GameStop when the institutional uh, short sellers were caught short in their investments in GameStop, which is a traditional bricks and mortar video game retailer in the US. It was hit very hard by the lockdown. It was shorted heavily by the hedge funds and private investors coordinated a huge buying spree and managed to push up the price of the shares by 1,700%, meaning that the hedge funds took heavy losses. Uh, and if you're interested in watching the documentary, there's a very good one on Netflix on it called Eat the Rich, which covers it. In a very entertaining way. But obviously, shorting is a genuine strategy. You know, billionaire hedge fund manager George Soros made a billion dollars from shorting the British pound during Black Wednesday in the 90s. Michael Burry, another hedge fund manager, made $100 million personally from shorting the US housing market prior to the global financial crash. So shorting can be highly profitable for traders. And it can be quite a good tool for investors in terms of hedging portfolios against short-term volatility. So, for example, here you could look at inverse ETS, which rise when the price of the underlying asset falls. Uh, I took out a FTSE 100 super short uh, in the early pandemic. It goes up by 2% for every 1% fall in the FTSE 100. So it can be a good way of reducing risk for short periods of time during volatility. I mean, volatility is an opportunity for traders. As investors, it's probably uh, important to try to avoid and ignore short-term volatility and focus more on the long term. And so once the market genuinely starts to show signs of recovery following a, a downturn, what's the best way for investors or traders to rebalance their portfolios for future gains? Yeah, we've talked about having that kind of having a core of defensive investments. But I think it's still worth, even at the same time, keeping a diversified portfolio. So you've got some high growth, more interesting investments around the outside, perhaps small caps or high yield bonds or commodities. And as we know, stock markets are ahead of the economic cycle. So they usually fall before a recession, but they recover typically six to 12 months after recession ends. So as you've mentioned, we've seen a rebound in tech stocks this year. Is that the early sign of a recovery or is that a false dawn? I think the jury's still out on that one at the moment. But as we start to see clearer signs of recovery, I think investors will naturally want to review and rebalance their portfolios. So probably reducing the defensive core, increasing exposure to higher growth equities. Again, the proportion and type will depend on your appetite for risk, but potentially increasing exposure in small caps. Large caps tend to do better in a recession because they've got more stable cash flow. They've got the financial firepower to weather a downturn. But small caps tend to outperform in rising markets because they tend to have superior earnings growth. I think another thing to think about is long-term structural winners. So markets with good long-term growth potential. AI, as we all know, is a very hot investing topic at the moment. Investors are very keen to back the AI pioneers. I think Microsoft, Microsoft probably surprised some of its competitors with the success of ChatGPT. But it's actually quite a difficult one for investors because they're not many pure play publicly listed AI companies. So investors might be looking for exposure, for example, via semiconductors, so the likes of AMD and NVIDIA, software, Microsoft and Alphabet, for example, or looking more at the uh, adoption side of things, so potentially financial services or healthcare companies. I also think this is probably quite a good area to invest via funds. I've just written an article on best AI funds for investors. There's a small number, but there's a range of different themes. And we've seen some quite attractive gains already in that area with you know five-year returns of more than 100% in some cases. In terms of other themes, I think there's obviously the transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy. That's going to require a huge increase in capacity over the next few years. We've also got other growth markets, electric vehicles, cloud services, cybersecurity, 
I think ethical investing is likely to be here to stay. It's had a fair amount of criticism of late, you know, whether it's style over substance, whether when push comes to shove, will shareholders really be willing to sacrifice profit for companies to pursue ESG criteria? But I think it's a theme that will be likely to continue. So I'd say worth repositioning your portfolio to include some high growth markets and companies, but also staying diversified and backing a number of horses. I think in terms of returns, those really high returns of the last bull run are unlikely to be repeated over the next few years. One of the takeaways from chatting to fund managers is some of them see double digit returns from mainstream equities as less likely over the next three to five years. So I think while investors probably will be hoping to make a high return from equities and cash, I think it comes back to that greed point of resetting expectations, not chasing unrealistic returns and being disciplined about investing. Joe, thank you so much for uh, for joining us today and for your insights. Where can our listeners find you online? Oh, uh, that's a very good question. Well, there's a wealth of articles first off on Forbes Advisor UK with more detail on some of the things we've discussed today. I also repost my articles on LinkedIn and also on Twitter under the highly creative name Joe, Gro- Joe G All Things Finance. And I also run online courses for teenagers on money management and investing, including students taking their Duke of Edinburgh Award. So if you're interested in finding out more about that, you can visit my website, moneymadesimple.co. And just want to say thank you very much for having me on the show. I really enjoyed chatting about investing. Excellent. Thanks very much, Joe.